thank you for coming to our third uh, keynote talk for Focus Series 2015. If you haven't already heard me talk about what Focus is, then this morning's keynote with Christian Smith, so last night's keynote with uh, also Christian Smith. I'm not going to do it again. Um, but today we have, uh, this afternoon we have Chair Lee Norman from Northern Seminaries. She is the Associate Professor of Theology. And we're glad she is here with us. Her talk that she's going to be delivering this afternoon is Idols and Icons, Learning to Bear God's Image from the Sun. She will also be speaking again this evening uh, for our final keynote of Focus Series 2015 in the White Auditorium at 7 p.m. Uh, prior to coming to Northern Seminary, she preached, she's taught at a lot of places, um, too numerous to mention. Uh, but she spent five years at Catholic College and Seminary teaching there. She wants me to use the mic for the recording. It is working a little bit closer. Um, five years teaching at Catholic College and Seminary and co-directing her Christian formation program. She also spent a year teaching theology at Wheaton College. Uh, Cherith has written a book, um, Knowing God by Name. She's also written numerous articles uh, and has uh, offered uh, other publications. A few that I will mention. Um, she's written a chapter on gender and the answer of handbook of evangelical theology. She's written uh, an article which we linked on our Facebook page. If you did not notice that, uh, you can check that out at, uh, afterward. Uh, Embody Human Sexual, the Only Way to Be a Christian in uh, Perspectives Journal. Uh, and she's also written another chapter, which is one of the reasons we asked her to come and speak with us with her theme being rethinking humanity more people before. She's written a chapter in the Cambridge Companion to the Evangelical Theology title, The Human Person in the Christian Story. She is currently working on a book on theological anthropology and the resurrection. I'm glad that we have uh, Dr. Norman here with us this afternoon this evening. Please give her a warm stir on your Become 
highly cognitive, highly heads on a stick idea, and utilitarian. What are we doing? What are, what's our purpose in a way that doesn't know how to get our bodies in the room? And if there's any group of people on the planet who ought to be able to do that well, it ought to be people who fall on incarnate Lord. And we are crappier at it than just about any group of people on the planet. You can't get people more scared of their bodies than putting a bunch of Christians in a room. Unless you put them in a church. <laughs> then, then we're like off limits and tired. Because somehow we have bought into something about getting our souls saved. If you can bring them to me, and please do, if you can find them for me in the Bible, you come and bring them to me, and I will change the course of everything I do for the rest of my life as a theologian, as a follower of Jesus Christ. But you won't be able to find that. You won't be able to find something about getting saved means accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Which means that you have some kind of eternal life insurance policy. Because really what God's going to do at the end of everything is blow up the world, and you're escaping. That's called Gnosticism. It's a heresy. And it was decried as a heresy before we ever got out of the first century in which Jesus was born in the common era, AD. The other heresies that go along with Gnosticism often have to do with Jesus. So when we talk about Jesus, which we're going to try to do this afternoon and tonight, and he's always the answer to every single question, right? And he's going to be the answer to a lot of things. In fact, to everything. Because he's the pivot point for everything. But when my students, whether they're undergraduates, whether they're young Sunday school folks, whether they're the older elders sitting around my table, whatever they are, they carry around really crazy ideas about Jesus. Like Jesus is the Son of God, spiritual, crazy glued to Jesus of Nazareth, human, and kind of moving around, and when he's feeling stuff, he's feeling it in his human body, and when he knows what he's thinking, he's using his divine brain, and he knows what he's thinking. That's also a heresy. It's called historianism. Because there's only one person, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth, who happens to be the incarnate Son of God, and he's just one person. It's not two persons stuck together. Neither has he lost his personhood by being some weird alloy, which, in the language of heresies, is called monophysitism. You just pour the divine, you pour the human into this thing, and it stirs up, and you get bronze, which has nothing to do with you or me, because I'm not bronze. I'm not a mixture of divinity and humanity. I'm humanity. And for him to come in and go, be like me. Watch me, and I'm going to save you in your humanity, though I'm absolutely nothing like you. Boy, talk about a Christian story that is deadly, let alone dead in the water, and probably why you don't tell anybody about it. Or worst and easiest of all to align up next to Gnosticism is Docentism, where Jesus just seemed to be human. This is the nice Clark Kent Superman version of Jesus. Where he's running around looking like Clark Kent. But actually, whenever he needs to really do something, he keeps his covering on, but he's able to do all those divine things because really he's God, who's just borrowing a body because he's actually got a lot of talking to do. And some divine things to show off to do so that when he saves us from our sins, we believe that he's God. That's a heresy. So I don't know who your Jesus is, but I'll bet you all three of those were present in your junior high youth group and might be present in your class 
and in your head, in your heart right now, which makes it really hard to figure out how we think about what it means to be human, because we don't know who to look at. Certainly not Jesus. If he's any of those, I. He's at the farthest away. And I came to your campus today to tell you a couple of really beautiful and fabulous things that I'm just going to tell everybody everywhere I go. And number one, the gospel is about the fact that you are going to get your human life back permanently. That is the story that we are getting. And the second and most profoundly amazing part of that is that there is only one human being who has thus far pulled it off. And he happens to be Jesus of Nazareth who is the only truly human there's ever yet been. And he happens to still be that. Can I say that again? He happens to still be that. I got an email a couple weeks ago from a friend of mine who is a pastor in Grand Rapids. She sent along an email from the board of her Church, the chairman of the board, who says, I, this is a really important, but just if you have time, could you just help me with this? I'm sorry, I'm just seeing your ashes. I love that. I'm just so glad that I got into church. I love that we're doing humanity on the day which, from dust to dust, dust we shall return. Thank you. I'm <laughs> sorry to point this poor woman out and embarrass her. This is Ash Wednesday, y'all. Talk about a great day to talk about the incarnate one in our humanity. Well, here's what was in this email. The guy says, I don't really know how to answer this question, but, but Jesus isn't still really human, right? Like, at some point in the ascension, like, he dumped his body at, like, cloud 37, or, I mean, he didn't say, like, I said, right? And, and, and he's back to being the son, right? He, he was done with that little 33-year chapter. So he's back in having some kind of lovely eternal fellowship with the Father, and at the same time twiddling his spiritual thumbs, waiting for the next thing he's allowed to do when the Father says, you can come back now. And he says, that's right, right? I just need support. And she writes me and says, I know you think about things like this. Could you help me? That's, that's <laughs> Jesus is not still human alone. He's busy. And your humanity and mine are joined to his by the Spirit, enveloped in the love of the Father. And he has asked and called you for you, every one of you, before the creation of the world to participate with him in what he is doing because that is what you were made to do. So we are not going to keep assigning divine things to him apart from being able to actually rescue us from our broken humanity. But the cool stuff that he does and the suffering that he does, welcome to what it means to be a human being empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. Now, that sounds like a heresy to some of you. <laughs> but I think that's sort of what's in the gospel. Gospel's plural. I think it's in the Luke Acts double gospel. I think it's the basic assumption of Paul when he's writing to church. He's going, I think we started with the Spirit, but now we're trying to add back in all this other stuff. But the gospel that we know is Jesus Christ. His whole life, his crucified life that is the resurrected one, who is now the ascended one, who sits at the right hand of the Father, who's poured out the possibility of us all actually beginning to participate with him by the Spirit getting our lives back already. And somewhere, depending on what church he's writing to, we've lost the plot a little bit. 
I need to rethink some things. So that whole little sermon you just got, there was like nowhere in my notes. <laughs> now we're going to try to figure out how to rescue a little bit of the time. But it's the heart of what we'll talk about tonight. It's the heart of what I wanted to bring visually to you this afternoon. Because it's become so much fun for me as a theologian when it's time to kind of um, look at the big helicopter view of what is the grand narrative that we're in, and then to kind of land and wrestle through the different areas that sort of emerge as what we call doctrinal areas. We've got to think long and hard about creation and its context and end up back to Jesus, ironically, and what do we do when we think about what does it mean to be saved and how crazy that kind of makes us, and when we think about all of these different doctrinal issues, how is there actually a story going on that is not about a set of propositions that you believe? And God is not going to give you an entrance exam to make sure that you got it right. And please don't do that to somebody who you're inviting to come into the fellowship of the trained God and find their way home. Because that's not their invitation either, is to just say the right ten things and then pray a prayer that says a certain kind of thing. I think I was hearing from the other room that there's something about communal embrace that actually sometimes helps us grow into and find out who we are by being together and with. But we do this very strange bifurcating. We do this bifurcating in Jesus, we split him out, we do this bifurcating in our human lives that are busy being talking heads on a stick, and then if you're anything like the campuses that I've been on, a good 20 to 25 percent of your campus um, has students with eating disorders. You have probably, I, was, I don't know, Christian should be here to tell us the stats, right? 35, 40 percent of practiced internet porn on a regular basis, some to the level of addiction, some to just habitual fantasy life. Some of you are coming in classes, and some of you are living in tremendous discord in your embodied life. After saying all the right things in chapel, singing the songs, deeply loving Jesus and the Father and the Spirit at some level, but not knowing whether he really likes your body. Not knowing what to do with your embodied life. Now, last year, you had Jamie Smith who is a dear friend of mine from Calvin, as your focus person. And I want to read to you a little portion from Jamie's first book in Desiring the Kingdom, because I think he hits the nail on the head, and that's partly why I would love us to look at the very um, tactile, tangible, no way to be disembodied reality of how the, the testaments, the covenant that holds us in our story was understood by our original family. When we go back and look at the family photo album, when we look at the stories of our, our generations who have gone before, the centuries in which they've lived, they did not have the same kind of bifurcating that we do predominantly today. Jamie writes this. He says, human persons are not primarily thinking beings, or even believing things, but rather imaginative, desiring animals who are definitively, fundamentally shaped by life. We are embodied, affective creatures who are primed by material practices that aim our hearts to certain ends, which in turn draw us to them in a way that transforms our actions by inscribing as habits or dispositions to act in certain ways. We're people who are lovers first, driven by the things that we desire, we move toward precognitively the things that we long for. And so they might be deeply disordered desires, but that's his contention first and foremost. So he says, in short, because we, we function toward those desires, we, we practice into them, we do things that fuel them and feed them or are fueled by them. 
He said, human being takes practice. And implicit in our practices is a social imaginary that orients and guides and shapes our desire and action. A social imaginary is an understanding of the world that is pre-cognitive and pre-reflective. You haven't thought it first. You haven't reflected on it first. You're in it before you did any of that. And he says it functions in an order before thinking and believing, and it's carried in images and stories and myths, and it forms our life. So he says basically what we do and why we do it deeply forms who we are and our understanding of whose we are. And out of the understanding of whose we are, we do or don't do what we are. Does that make sense? So he says, when we look at common cultural practices, we as Christians assign oftentimes some kind of a neutral value to the practices that are embedded in all kinds of narratives that are claiming our attention, all kinds of storylines that say, you might not know what to do with your body, but we do. The world can very quickly tell you what to do, not what to think, but what to do with your money, with your time, with your body, with your relationships or lack thereof, it will fill in the blank because it gets it actually that you're driven by your desires. So he says they're not just things that we do, they're habit forming, identity shaping, love directing rituals that capture our imaginations. And he says here's the challenge for the church. He says while the mall, Victoria's Secret and Jerry Bruckheimer are grabbing hold of our gut, our cardia, the, the core of our desire, and fanning it into flame by means of our bodies and senses, in stories and images and sights and sounds, and a commercial version of smells and belts. It's like a liturgy. He says the church's response is oddly rationalist. It plumps us down in a worship service that culminates in a 45-minute didactic sermon, a sort of holy lecture, trying to convince us of the dangers by implanting doctrines and beliefs in our minds. While the mall paradoxically appreciates that we are desiring animals, the church still tends to see us as Cartesian minds. While secular liturgies are after our hearts through our bodies, the church thinks it only has to get into our heads while Victoria's Secret is fanning a flame in our cardia, the church is trucking water to our minds. While secular liturgies are enticing us with effective images of good life, the church is trying to convince us otherwise by depositing ideas. Such a rationalist response is inadequate and it's mistargeted because it carries with it a flawed methodology. It's bifurcated. It's splitting. It's gnostic. So when I talk about false narratives, we did this about two minutes, and then I'm going to actually try to slow show some slides, which for me is a big step forward in technology. Usually I just sort of run around my classroom and, and act out what I want you to know. But I want you to see some of these images so that these the word picture plays, these, these are word images that come forward when we actually are given introduction to the sun, who's going to teach us what it means to be human. They come from a very long, long line of real lived history and real images. And they tell a story. So that when Jesus finally shows up, he's the culmination of a really long story. He's not the beginning of our story. He's the culmination of God's story of making a people for his name that's been going on from the beginning. But when we do not recognize that story and we don't see our, our lives as people who are embedded in a drama that really does actually ask a particular kind of way of being, a scriptedness that helps us understand who we are, we also get clueless about the false narratives that are gripping us all the time. And the false narratives that happen in culture 
are many, which is basically that it's okay to deconstruct the human being for the sake of the greater human being. It's okay to hate your body in the guise of loving your body and overworking. It's okay to use your body and not care morally because somehow you can be a self all by yourself who's not a person, who fundamentally has to be in relation in order to be a person. The narratives are a million. The narratives around what to do with your money. The narratives around what you think human rights is about, what we think racial privilege is about. The fact that we're going to have a racial discourse, and we're trying to do this at Northern, but to have an, a racial discourse that is going to only be possible in the United States. And somewhere fundamentally at the bottom of that discourse is, actually, I hope everybody else gets equal rights to stuff like I have it without me having to be divested of any of my stuff. Oh, I forgot to say that most of our stuff comes out of the backs of like 80% of the world. So this isn't racial equality. This is American racial equality, which has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Listen to your narratives. When I was 18 years old, I went and worked at a youth hostel for a summer in Amsterdam. And my German manager would make really snide remarks regularly about Americans. And one day, I finally was like, really? It hurts my feelings. I thought that in Christ, there's like no Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female, German, or American. He says, well, that's true, Chair. If only it's just really hard for me to figure out how you can be a Christian and be an American. Now, I'm 18. It's 1978. And I've grown up with documentaries around the Holocaust. And guess who I think is like the redeemed Satan embodied person? Uli, my German manager. Aren't you lucky that God's gospel is big enough to cover you, you German? Do I say that to him? No. But do I have that weird narrative in my head somewhere as a kid? Absolutely. And I'm looking at him. What do you mean? He says, well, you know, you guys come every summer. And he says, I listen to you pray. And he says, before we get started in the day and as we're praying, he goes, when you just like thank God for the basics and then you ask God for the basics, we haven't even gotten to the stuff you really want God to do. He says, the stuff that's on the basic list wouldn't make the wish list of 95% of the human race that's ever lived. And you're pissed at God if he doesn't give you that. And if you think that's not true, I lived in England at 9-11. And the discourse shifted within five days from how over my wild eye lament to how, oh Lord, did this happen to us? We are embedded in storylines that want to claim our identities and our whole persons to live and move and function and have our being within a story that desires particular ends. And we pretend as Christians that actually our whole embodied life is not caught up in that. When it not only is, God loves that it is. And wants to give you your story back. Wants to give you your life back so that you can get on with finally starting to be human and you get to start before you die. Because with him you actually get to start dying to some stuff so that you can begin to start living into resurrection. So this odd bifurcation that pretends that we're not in a story, that we just believe some things, in the ancient world, they had no clue what that would have been like. And when I mean the ancient world, I'm talking about what Jesus would have called ancient. Like way back there in, in <coughs> Egypt, as the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are caught in a 400 year period from the movement of being people who are cared for to people who are the ones doing the caring and the carrying on their backs of the rest of the culture. So I want you to see, and just walk with me really quickly for the remainder of our time, 
at how deep these images are so that you, when you begin to hear Jesus called the image or icon of God, why it would be that he would come incarnate as a human being. Was that something that was just God's rescue operation to kind of dip in to help human beings? Or is this always been the place and space and dimension of God's presence uniquely upon the earth? And the answer, I think you'll quickly see, is the lack. So we've been invited into a very deep story, and I'm not going to read Ephesians 1, but the prayer that Paul prays prays us into that trying story before the creation of the world. It was that you would be holy and blameless human children joined to the life of the triune God through the lavish love of the Father and the gift of the Son and the deposited spirit who is guaranteeing the outcome of your human life, not your immortal soul. It presumes, Old and New Testament, that God has never been about the business of saving individuals for heaven. He's not rescuing individuals. He's getting you in one at a time, but he's drawing you into a people for his name. Because there's no way to be human except as part of the people in relationship. And that's how he's going to talk about what does it mean to be human from the very get-go. It's how God claims a people for his name through that first covenant. And it's how people, even in the New Testament, if you keep remembering, y'all, when you're reading the New Testament, these are first-generation believers. These are people who are coming in one at a time from something else into a brand new thing. So any of you who sort of come up through the church, it's kind of hard to read yourself into how to be in that story in a certain way because you've already been in it. You're carried in it. So what does your before and after look like really needs to be re-examined to some degree. Because what God has always been about is the business of making a people. And the language of the first covenant is that about a people for his name, his glory, where his name sits and rests, all of his identity, all of his character, all of his power is manifested in the creator world, in the world, on planet Earth. Which means that we have to keep shifting our focus into a much larger story, which you're going to watch the recapitulation of unit time, of, of the ways that all through the Old Testament and into the New, there's a story of creation, and out of creation comes an exodus, whether it's the very first one in Genesis 3, to a new creation, whether it's a dove and water with Noah, and then it's going to happen again through the Red Sea, and then it's going to happen again at the Jordan, and then it's going to happen again at the Exile, it's going to happen again and again and again. That God is not changing the plot ever. But that the three who are the one are going to bring their human children home to allow them to finally become those who can love in freedom without being broken in the process. Which means the emphasis is not just on what you have been saved from, but as your um, focus emphasis is, that what is it for? What have you been saved for? if we're going to use the language of the church. And it's actually to be who you are and whose you are permanently, forever. So this is a way to help you into your story. <laughs> Looks very Christian, doesn't it? Um, this is actually a modern rendition by, uh, I don't know if you had to read John Walton in any of your Old Testament classes. This is a picture that was done by John's son. And it's a sort of a modern rendition of the cosmology, the understanding in Egypt at the time that God first speaks to Moses as to how the world is functioning. And I'm going to step over here. It's the assumption that there's a sky god, and that there's an earth god, and that there is a god of the air who holds them apart, whether they're married or brother and sister depending on the telling, they're always trying to reach one another again, which is why always the waters are coming back down from the earth. It's the story of, of talk, we see that one language 
because all of those things are happening, you can have babies. You can have crops. You can see the world function in the way that it should. Because if you do what you're supposed to do in relation to the God, or God's plural that are here, then in return, you can hope that they will fulfill their end of the bargain. And humans, in a picture like that, they call them the cattle of Ra. They come from his tears. They come either from the sweat of his brow or from a battle that he's been fighting. So humanity in an Egyptian cosmology is detritus, unless you're of the royal household. And then there's one incarnate person who actually gets to bring the gods present in a human form, who actually gets to live as a human being. And his name is fe ra -O. In this world, you have a process that happens. And I'm telling you this because I want you to listen for the signals. In the ancient cosmological world, for every one of those gods, and this is happening all the way up until the time of Jesus. So this is not just occurring way, way, way back then. This is part of the Gentile um, pantheon of gods that kind of has to work out how the world actually functions and what are people's places in that in relation to the divine. What are we about and what are we for? What does it mean to be human? What is our purpose? Exactly the questions of your conference. They aren't asking them, they assume them. They know them. So when it comes to functioning in relation to an idol, the idol is always set up in the context of a temple palace garden. And the temple palace garden is the place where both the divine power and sort of the political power of the world intersect. And there's always this sort of garden feature that comes with it because it's the place where sort of life and abundance and flourishing is represented, that the god has the power to bring forth life if you're the god of the Nile or, or crops or whatever it is. If you're the god of fertility, then it's children. It's that there's, there's a fecundity that comes. So a temple palace garden. And on the sixth day of that celebration, when that thing is finally constructed and finished, you bring in the idol, the image of the god. And in this case, it's a start date, and she would never look like that. Because Cleopatra would never have been better dressed than a start date in her center. You would be deck her with, with literally everything you could come up with that would be worthy of a goddess, so that she feels good about herself in the created order in relation to you, and you're gonna eat in front of her, and you're gonna sacrifice in front of her, and you're gonna do all these things in relation to her, so she is gonna be better dressed than anybody. All of these gods are. And once they're set up and established after they've been manufactured, and the Old Testament is full of descriptions of how these guys are manufactured, and these women, females, male figures, the last part on day six is what is called a spiration ceremony or a spiration ritual. And you take that image, and those priests, if they just get it right, they come up and they raise the thing up and they breathe into that image. And then they can finally carve the eyes open and the ears open and the mouth open because once they finish the breathing ceremony, they trust that the God who is not the idol, but who is absolutely present wherever the idol is present, will come present upon that image when it's finished. And then on day seven, everybody rests. And that does not mean they take off a day and put their feet up. Resting in the ancient world is things finally start being what they were meant to be. Things begin to function because now the God is present and the proper relationship is set up and the correspondence of what the God is going to do and what we are going to do has been set in order. And so finally, on the perfect day, seven, everything starts being what it was meant to be. On the bottom, 
of statues like this. This one is 9th century BC. The King Hadadi C, ruler of Ghassan, at the bottom of his statue, and in the language of all of these cultures, do you know the language that they're using on these images? In Hebrew, it's salem and devout. It's image and likeness. This is the salem and devout of Adad, you see. <coughs> Where the image was, where the tzalem and demut of the god was, so was the god. That is a really concrete image. It's very different from going, well, what makes image and likeness in Christianity is our cognitive function, or our rational souls, or whatever we want to say. In this world, where God makes his own creation story now, nobody was going there in their head or their body. Nobody. And we are not smarter than them. There was a story being told here. I was reading yesterday 1 Samuel 5. And this is where the... Ark of the Covenant has been sitting with um, Eli and his sons and Samuel, who is still young. And if you know the story, you know that Eli's sons are a mess in every conceivable way and have nothing to do with bearing the character and presence of God on the earth. And so God tells Eli, they're, they're to be priesting actually my presence. And they don't know how to because they don't know who I am and they don't know who they are. And so there will be a destruction that comes upon them. And right thereafter, there, there's a description of a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. And the Israelites are like, you know, we should bring our God into the middle of the battlefield. And if you think this is like new, uh, about 800 years later, this is exactly what people are doing when Alexander the Great is going around conquering the known world. They are hauling statues of Apollo into the middle of the battlefield of Tyre. Because somebody had a dream that Apollo was going to lead them, and they needed his power. So they hauled him out on a cart. Where the statue is, where the image is, where the idol is, so is the god. And they find out that these Israelites, the Philistines find out that these Israelites have done this, and they're like, oh no. We actually know that, we know their story. We know that they have powerful gods and that their gods delivered them from Egypt and did all these crazy and wild things. So they're like, all right, guys, it's like, like the halftime thing with the football team. You need to really get in there. You need to really fight. And they do, and they win. And they bring that ark into the presence of the temple of Dagon. And the next morning, Dagon is on his face. And they haul him back up again. Very nervous now. And the next morning, he's not just on his face. His face and his arms and his hands are busted off. And all that's left is his torso. And they get it. That there has been a power encounter. That where these realities fight it out, we thought we conquered this God because our God was bigger. And we have obviously lost the plot. And then you just watch them figure out how to get rid of that thing as fast as they can. It's fundamentally built into their understanding that there's a way to have an image or something that represents the presence of the God. And in this context, you have this kind of language, which probably is a creation narrative that starts getting told either coming out of Egypt or battle, depending on where the scholarship is going to fall. But it's out of a tremendous deliverance where they've actually seen God do something that is impossible to do in human power. And so they have to actually tell a different story than that one of Geb and Shu, and Nut, which they know really, really well after 400 years. And they have to tell a story about the God who's actually brought them out and forward. And they hear a story and they tell a story of a six-day creation of God's temple, palace, garden, where the earth is 
my footstool, and the heavens are my canopy. And the whole testament is full of the architectural image of temple building, and it takes all of creation into that construction. And then instead of us making something for God in their face, he says, oh no, thanks very much. But just like you can't make a temple for me out of human hands, I am going to make my own image and likeness. And the only way to, we can discover to actually be that for a triune God is to have men and women who function as human beings in distinction and also in unity. They will bear our image. They will carry our likeness. They will function with and for us upon the earth. Which is basically to say that. That to be human is to be God's idol. This is why you're not allowed to have any or make any. Because you are it. Where the human beings are upon the earth, they, God has claimed this is where my presence dwells. These are my living images who see what God sees, who speak for God because they hear God. They are prophets and priests with dominion and life-giving possibility over the creation of the earth to bring forth flourishing and culture and delight and beauty and joy because we love what we have made. And to be present with and for our creation, we give them, the ones who we've loved, into this way of being with and for us and them. We breathe the Spirit upon them. God's own inspiration ceremony in Genesis 2. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the Adam went from being dust on Ash Wednesday, went from being a non-living idol to one who has been indwelt by the very presence of the living God. So the assumption about what it means to be human is that you are actually spirit-filled, spirit-breathed human beings. Which is why it's going to be so important when we just keep looking at Jesus because you can't let him get away with doing what he did because he had a divine credit card. Because the scripture tells you he gave up. He said, this is everything I'm entitled to with my divinity and you know what I'm going to do? What's your name? Pink? Grace? If Grace doesn't have a divine credit card, and I'm going to do this with and for Grace because I'm going to give her her life back because once I'm joined to her, we're permanently joined to the, the incarnation back into the trailer. Because if Grace can't do it the way I'm going to do it, I can't ask Grace to do it. So how, am I, how does he do what he does? He does it by the anointing of the Spirit. So he's this miracle person because the spirit conceives him with the DNA of his mom. So when you meet him, he's probably going to be about a foot shorter than me. And he's probably got his uncle's nose or his mom's. And he calls somebody in the new creation, mom. And he's very curious about what you're thinking right now because you know what? He's human. And he has a human mind that's reconciled to God. And so Paul says, you really want the mind of Christ. Because the Spirit searches the deep things of God. And he's the one who's brought us right into the presence of the one human being who's actually lived image-bearing in its authenticity. He has finally shown us what humanity is like. And it's cool. And it costs your life. Because it takes the same power of the Spirit to heal someone or to raise him from the dead, to stand with someone in their suffering in the in-between space of the already and the not yet. Because you have to listen and walk as image bearers to say, Jesus, with the Father of the Spirit, what are we doing today? What are we doing? This Jewish 
scholar, says, Genesis 126 can only be understood against the background of an ancient Yahweh statue. Humans are regarded as the statue of God, created according to God's silver and mood. Here, these are used as synonyms denoting a statue. So there was no need of a divine image. Why you couldn't make one wasn't because you don't get to see God. It's because God was going, I want the world to see me really, really clearly. Look at them. That's what I look like when I am in dwelling creaturely for the presence of the earth. Look at them. Are they not glorious? Are they not beautiful? This is who they are. Are the children my image bearing ones? So idols are to be children of God in the Hebrew scripture. They're to be embodied vice regions of God's living presence who see and speak and hear and act with and for and like Yahweh. If you're looking for a purpose, it was built into the beginning of the story. No being nice for Jesus and trying to figure out how to just get up every day and try really hard. I hope he's not as mad at you today as you might have been yesterday because you tried pretty hard, but they just went to hell and hand us. You are the place of God's image upon the earth. And Jesus uses this language. You're my son to the people of Israel. And then he begins to call them his queen. And now I'm running out of time. I see Robbie standing there. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go five more minutes. I wanted to play you a, a song I just recommended to you. Spotify, Penny and Sparrow. A Living Cop. A beautiful, beautiful song of this sort of heart of God right here. Because what happens? When does he call in his queen? It's in the place where image bearing and idolatry start to look like this. We hear all about idolatry, right? All through the Old Testament, right? Idolatry, idolatry, idolatry. How can we be God's idols? Idolatry is a bad thing. Well, idolatry is a bad thing. Image bearing is not. Idolatry is false image bearing. And he says, dead idols are the ones that have mouths but can't speak, and ears that can't hear, and eyes that can't see, and they're supposed to function, but they're dead. And in fact, they have what? No ruach in them, no breath, no spirit. And he says, you will look like what you worship. So clear it out. Because you are my people upon the earth, and the only place the world has to look to see what I look like, and what I am doing, and my belovedness for and with, is you. Which is why the story keeps getting recapitulated over and over as they keep moving farther and farther away from true image bearing. So idolatry in the Old Testament is actually the refusal of a human being to bear our embodied vocation. And in the language of Ezekiel 16, that queen who got taken from the side and washed and raised up and dressed beautifully and wed to God, he said, You're, I gave you my glory and my splendor. I shared it all with you. And you rose to become beautiful and I made you my queen. And he said, And then you turned around and everything that I gave you, you gave away. He says, you prostituted it to anybody who would walk by. You lifted your skirts to anybody. He says, actually, prostitution is too good of a word because at least they get paid, and you gave it away from nothing. You lost your identity because you gave away my identity. So you hear this finally in Isaiah. Who is blind but my servant? and deaf like the messenger I sent. Who is blind like the one in covenant with me? Blind like the servant of the Lord. You have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. And yet there is the promise of new creation life, that God will restore his image bearers in a picture of a resurrection new creation in Ezekiel's valley of the dry bones, having already 
prophetically spoken to creation first in chapter 36, promising all of creation that when the image bearer gets restored, everybody gets their life back. This is what we hear Paul playing with in Romans 8. And I'm going to leave with this picture. So I will pick up a little bit this evening in um, where we left off today. I hope some of you are able to follow there. But I'm going to leave with this picture because I want you to hold in your mind right here, even though he's white <laughs> and clearly is a product of, of this time and image. But the entry of Jesus into this time and space, the language of being called the image of the invisible God, that he is the likeness of God, that he is the restoration, that everything about image and likeness has been restored to him, everything, means that the only way that's possible is if he completely enters into the human story and redeems the story all the way through to its new way of being, which is his currently ascended, resurrected life. In the Old Testament, once everybody went into exile, when the queen gave it all away and they lost their home, and the presence of God lives up that temple, they lived for 400 years without any evidence of the spirit of living God in the ways that they've seen it before. There's no prophetic voice. There's no healing. There's no restriction. They long to see the signs of God and what they have is law to take his place. And when that law gets rewritten, those scriptures are rewritten through this diaspora population now, it's written in Greek as well. And the language for idol is the language, is the word icon. So when you're reading in your Greek New Testament or your English New Testament image, if you see in your Greek New Testament icon, everywhere that you're seeing the language of idol and image bearing in the Old Testament, you're seeing that word icon. What does it mean for God to have come present and take on our image bearing as the final and true human being who still happens to be so? We'll talk a little bit more about that today. Thank you. Thank you, We have about five minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Um, Thank you very much. That was, that was really good. Should have gone to talk. Uh, it sounds. I know you're from Calvin, or you guys have been you know, Calvin for a while, and um, and uh, we and those aren't necessarily fledgling in school. Obviously, with the school fledgling tradition. Uh, but your talks are very fledgling for possible, except for one point where you said. Um, you know, there's one perfect person, and that's Christ. And, you know. So do you think it's, this is a very Wesley question that I'm going to ask, right? <laughs> do you think that it's possible that in this life, if Christ comes, right, which I think you express well, and, you know, fully, um, and also fully divine, but does, is it possible as Christ was fully human and does not sin or, you know, perfection or whatever, is that possible for us as well in this life? Well, first of all, I was certainly a Calvin as a tall blonde woman, but not Dutch. <laughs> and not reformed in their particular way of being reformed. Um, so I grew up in a Pentecostal tradition, and and so there, I just feel like, yeah, I'm just a contagion to everybody I know. So it's a good question to ask. Um, I think that the possibility is there because I think that the spirit is among us. So when I go to Calvin, they're like, well, what do we do with that? I go, well, I actually need to take the cork out of the bottle and you need to submit to the personal work of the spirit, which would actually help you finally become a human being. I also think that there is a brokenness that runs through the core of us that is not just about individual perfection, 
It's about being part of systemic brokenness. So even if I'm obeying the Spirit to the best that I can, I'm still part of really broken, sinful systems. And so it moves sin out of my sins to sin in a really big way. It just is like, I be responsible as a person who's white, who is an American, who lives in 2014, 15, <laughs> um, that, that I'm part of systemic realities that, that God is redeeming and also in Christ is called redeemed, right? So I feel like there is a very much an already and a not yetness to that question. And the thing that's so fantastic about Jesus' humanity <laughs> in terms of, like, so to grant the best of Calvin and who's going to basically just throw us back into the New Testament and Hebrews and the places where we see Jesus functioning really as our high priest, is to say there actually is a human being who stands in for us, who's really mediating my humanity every single minute. So the Father, with the Spirit, sees me absolutely finished. Sees me done, because he never sees me apart from the Son. So there's, in a weird way, the triune God is not stressed about my ongoing being conformed to the Son, and yet that's really all they're always doing, is being in relation to me, and that relationship is going to conform me with the people of God to the image of the Son. And, and there, that's my purpose. That's what I'm doing. So it's, it's always, I think, a matter of obedience. It's learning to not think of obedience as of adhering to a list of rules. But obedience becomes this re-commandeered, gorgeous, gorgeous word of what does it look like when we actually live in correspondence to the Father? When Jesus is like, I just do what the Father's doing. I just see what he's doing, and I'm doing that. And I'm doing it by the power of the Spirit. 